chapter 4. I'd like to talk about a very serious subject. Um, ultimately, for a couple of weeks, I'd like to talk about heaven and hell. Why does there have to be a heaven and a hell? And why don't people tend to believe? Well, especially in hell. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. The path of the just is as the shining light that shines more and more under the perfect day. But the way of the wicked is as darkness, and they don't know what they stumble over. Okay, now if you really think about this verse, very deep and very spiritual, what's it saying? That everybody is going somewhere. Everybody's in transition, everybody's in continuity, everybody's going somewhere. And you're never going to, it's also teaching something that I think is very true, that you're never the same person you were yesterday. You're just more of what you were yesterday. More. And more tomorrow, and more tomorrow, and more tomorrow. Because that's the way God made humanity. You're never static. You're always going more. Now, more what? Well, it depends on which direction you're going. The path of the justice is the shining of the light under the perfect day. And so you set out, it's a pathway. Salvation is not a one-time experience, it's a pathway. You set out on this journey and it's like, you just got a little bit of light because it's the breaking of the day, just enough. But if you keep going that same direction, it's the sunrise, okay? You're going to the sunrise. So by 10 o'clock you see more than you saw at six o'clock and by noon, man, you see everything in its complete light. Now, about late 1970s, I got jolted off one path and onto the other. I had very little light, but I walked in whatever light I had, and I've spent the rest of the time just trying to progress. You know, I often think, gosh, I haven't made much progress at all. The point is to get in the right direction and move. Doesn't matter how much you measure your progress. The matter is if you're going, where are you going? And he says that it's the same with the wicked, only the opposite. The sun's going down. Even in the, you know, at the beginning, I mean, there's a sense in which everybody has enough light. Everybody has enough light. And the soul can only be nourished by light, truth, and reality. And you're supposed to keep your soul open to light. But if you're not careful, see, then different, different trends, different attitudes, even the spirit of the age, and trick people into rejecting light, shutting it out. The wicked are on a path too, only the sun's going down, and the further down the path, the darker. It's a continuum. It's uh, very similar to the first psalm that says, Blessed is the man that does not walk in the uh, path of the ungodly, counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. Notice it's a continuum. You go from walking to standing to sitting. That's life. You start off walking. Well, if you're walking, you could turn around. But if you don't turn around, you sooner or later your walk hardens into a stance. And that's a little bit harder, but you can break yourself out of a stance. But in the end, you're in a chair. It's the increasing paralysis of sin. You go from the ungodly to the sinner to the scornful, where you don't believe anything. The path of the wicked is like that. You just, it just gets darker and darker and darker. The whole world's going like that, by the way. The darkness is very much increasing in this world. Gosh, when I go away, sometimes 
um, because I don't have any really exposure to news and I don't even care, I don't want to hear what's going on in the world. And all of a sudden, it's like my mind gets clear and I can very, very see and think very perceptively, very clearly. And you come, when I come back in, and even at the airport, they got TV uh, news on all the time, and it's like it hits you like a blast furnace, just how bad it really is getting in this world, which is another subject for another time. But man, the darkness is increasing. Everyone's going somewhere. This is what God, this is what God told Adam and Eve at the beginning, that humanity and its development would be divided into uh, what he called the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Go to Genesis chapter 3. This is, has everything to do with heaven and hell. Why? Well, what's the end? The end is either heaven or hell. Someone offered me a third option one time. It looks so attractive. Might not be heaven or hell. It might be purgatory. To me, that is the worst deception of the Catholic Church. Because it's so attractive. My general thinking was, I don't know anyone bad enough to go to hell. And I don't know anyone good enough to go to heaven. Most of us, isn't it true, right in the middle there, we're going to purgatory? Good Lord. What a deception. We actually hope for that, you know. What if you died thinking that's where you're going to be and you weren't saved? When Adam and Eve sinned, God made a pronouncement, not to them, not to them, but to the serpent. And I was telling people over in New Zealand this, in a different message. But why didn't God tell them uh, the gospel? He told it to Satan. Well, when they sinned, see, he brought them up before the bar of justice. And uh, he said to Adam, who told you you were naked? Now, why would God ask a question of anybody? since he knows everything. The reason is because he wants to elicit a humble confession. But Adam wouldn't have anything to do with that. He uh, refused accountability, so he went right to Eve. Eve, he asked her some questions. Why? He wanted to elicit from her a humble confession. Why did he want that? Because he intended to save them. How many are glad that the Lord, Lord wants to save man? Well, then when he went to the third perpetrator, the serpent, there were no questions. Why? He had no intention to save him. Instead, he pronounced on him the judgment that would come on his head, also a prophecy of the whole course of human history. He said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head. But you shall bruise his heel. Now that's the original gospel. It's in Genesis chapter 3. The original gospel. The seed of a woman. Well, women don't have seed. They have eggs. Men have seed. So how could a person be the seed of a woman? Well, if he's virgin born. He told the serpent, a virgin born savior would come and crush your head and undo your work. But not without pain. You will bruise his heel. So in that sense, the seed of the woman is singular. There is a, Jesus is the seed of the woman. And the seed of the serpent is singular. For the Antichrist is coming. Listen, everybody. There have been many Antichrists down through time. But all in preparation for the ultimate man of sin. Whose time has now come. He's about to be unveiled. The seed of the serpent. But there's another sense of this prophecy in which it's uh, plural. All of humanity divided into two groups. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Now, what's he talking about? Is he talking about physical birth? No. Because the devil can't have physical children. He's talking about an inward disposition, an inward affinity. The humanity is going to go one or two ways. Either they're going to come 
totally into agreement with the woman and her husband and what they stood for, or they're going to be totally in agreement with Satan internally, whether they know it or not. Okay. Who is the seed of the woman? Well, God says, when God did deal with Adam and Eve, to cover their sin, they put on fig, fig leaves. They were brilliant, really. These are the original human beings. There's no defects. Brilliant. So they make clothes out of fig leaves. Only God strips them of their fig leaves. And then to their horror, they see the first physical death where he takes something like a lamb and slays it, blood spilling out, life surrendered, strips off the the fleece of the lamb and instead of nice neat tidy fig leaves a bloody garment he makes for them put these on okay now who are the seed of the women all those who allow God to strip them of their self-righteousness and will submit who all those who acknowledge that sin deserves death and that will humbly submit to the God-appointed substitute, the one who died in our place for our sins, the one we sang of and prayed of, the one who took our place in judgment and spilled his blood to make us acceptable to God. Those are the seed of the woman. They, uh, they await uh, the triumph, the ultimate triumph of Christ, even though they must endure persecution. For the higher goal, for the sake of the higher goal, they are witnesses to the truth in this world of the life. This is the seed of the woman. All those who have that inward disposition, and who then are the seed of the serpent. Well, I want to read a description by a theologian that I like, because he said it better than I. Who then are the seed of the serpent? All those who manifest that spirit of independent pride by which their father, the devil, all those who will not acknowledge their own hopeless condition, nor will they submit to be saved by the merits of the Son of God, but will either themselves do what is to be done, or else proudly deny the necessity of doing anything at all, and they clamor against God, if they have any belief in His existence at all, because He doesn't at once gratify all their wishes with no reference whatsoever to their guilt or the broken law. Blinded and maddened by self-conceit, they believe the lie of the serpent and considering themselves as God have consequently no reverence for him. Nor do they hesitate to defy his will. Think of our day. <laughs> no hesitation whatsoever to defy his will if their own inclination prompts them to do so. Such are the serpent's seed, distinguished by the spirit which animates their father and federal head, and doomed at last to share with him in the lake of fire. You know, John the Baptist wasn't just calling people snakes when he preached. He wasn't just coming up with epithets and insulting people just because he's an angry preacher. He's actually li literally referring to Genesis. Brood of white vipers! God-defying serpent seed. Who warned you to come and flee from the wrath to come? Jesus said, you're of your father the devil. To the, to the religious leaders. All of mankind will be divided between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And that is the explanation for the world today. And the situation we're in. Now, it didn't take long for this to manifest, and that's my point of my message today. I want you to go to Genesis 4, and I want you to look at the Bible story and realize that uh, this book of Genesis is the foundation. In other words, everything critical to humanity. The author of Scripture is God. He's going to give us a book of everything basic, okay, as far as salvation. What we need to know about man, his state, where we're at, where we're going, where we're headed. Genesis is very end times. Genesis and Revelation are almost interchangeable. This is a huge book. So why of the 50 chapters of Genesis does we have Genesis 4, the story of Cain and Abel? It's not just the story of the first murder. It's an illustration of the path 
the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, the, the, the man on the path leading to light, the man on the path with the sun going down, the explanation for the world as we see it today. It's much deeper. There would be no point in putting an account just of a murder as a murder. And by the way, Gen Cain and Abel aren't God, Adam and Eve's only children. There's a theological point that he's making here. Let me read this passage here. Adam knew wife, Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. You know what the word Cain means? I got him. I got who? Remember what God said to her? You'll be saved by the woman having, giving birth. The seed of the woman. So she thinks, this is it. This is the one. And names him Cain. This is him. The Messiah. How many know she was disappointed? She again bear his brother Abel. By the time she had Abel, she knew. How do I know? The meaning of the name Abel. Vanity. A breath. She's discouraged by now. And Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Well, this is very important. They both worshipped. Where would you worship in those days? There was no temple. I, a lot of theologians believe that you go back to where the garden, where that cherubim is, and there you set up an altar. And there you offer to God worship. How'd they know how to worship? Their parents taught them how to worship. They each brought a sacrifice, but God accepted one and not the other. Now, what's the difference? See, every sacrifice you bring to God is a statement. So, when Abel takes the best of his flock and kills it, he's replaying what happened in the garden. And he brings a broken lamb, the best one, with the blood streaming through his fingers to God at the altar. He's actually making a statement. He's saying, I deserve to die. My sin deserves death. But please accept me on the basis of this substitute which you have appointed. That's a very simple statement. He puts it on the altar and fire comes down and consumes it. And by that he knows that he is in fellowship with God. I deserve to die. Sin deserves death. Now, when Cain brought his offering, he brought the fruit of the ground. Now, he's making a statement. And it's a statement about God. It's not an irreligious statement. He's saying, you are the creator. You made everything, and you have blessed the ground. And I bring you this fruit of the ground which I have worked. I bring it to your altar. And he waits, and no fire fell. Why? Look, you've got to worship God on two levels ever since the fall. In Revelation, there's two songs. In Revelation 4, and we know this song, Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power, for thou hast created. You must worship the Creator. You must acknowledge Him who gave you life and being. That's the old song, and it's great but inadequate. Why? Well, something happened where we need a new song. So in Revelation 5, it says, they say to the Lord a new song, worthy is the Lamb who was slain 
to receive power and riches and glory. For by thy blood thou hast purchased us unto God. That's literally the new song. The old song, new song. Abel comes with blood and sings a new song unto God. A song which makes him acceptable to God. Because he not only owns God as creator, but as redeemer. But Cain, for whatever reason, would only own God as creator. He wouldn't acknowledge he needed to be redeemed. You see? So God didn't smite him. He just didn't accept his offering. What happened then? Well, it says that Cain was furious, that's wroth, and depressed. He's depressed. A lot of depression is subdued anger. But he doesn't say anything about it. And so the Lord speaks to his soul. The Lord said unto Cain, Why are you wroth and why are you depressed? Once again, why does God answer, ask questions? Well, he wants to bring things out. He actually wants to dialogue with us. He actually wants to interact with us. Here's the thing. Cain doesn't have an answer to God. If you come to the church and put yourself outside the body and refuse to sing and pray and lift holy hands and enter in. Don't you have a response? Don't you have anything to say to your God? Isn't there some response inside that should be required? But Cain had no answer to God. He said nothing. You look at God's encouragement. If you do well, you'll, will, won't you be accepted? If you don't well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, but you shall rule over him. There you go, Lord. He's always encouraging people. You don't have to be mastered by sin. Did you know that? But you should be aware of it. Like he said, sin's crouching outside the door as though sin's a lion waiting to eat your lunch. That's why Jesus taught us to pray all the time. Lead me not into temptation, O Lord, but deliver me from evil. Because we shouldn't have so much confidence in ourselves that we think we could never defect. Defection's never far away. Do you believe that this morning? But see, Cain's going the wrong path. Because he has nothing to say to God. Can't you see? That it doesn't start off with murder. It just starts off with shutting out the light. Refusing to yield. Having nothing to say to God. Thou deaf and dumb spirit, get out. Be loosed. Respond to God. <laughs> But he's on a bad path. But he's not too far gone. And God even encourages him. If you do right. And he knew what right was. Right. You're going to have to get a lamb. A God appointed substitute. And you're going to have to break the lamb's body. Blood may stream down your fingers. It's not neat and tiny and humane. It's bloody. Why? Because it's a bloody acknowledgement. I deserve to die. There's no pride in that. The Lord says, just do right, and I'll accept you. But Cain didn't have anything to say to God. See, he's going further down the path. And the darkness is deepening. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. The idea there, Cain talking to his brother. Hey, brother, I want to talk to you. There's no hint with the brother. No hint 
what's coming. Come on out in the field with me. Let's talk. Before no one else is around. And then he killed him. He killed him. Now this crops up again in the New Testament. I won't have you turn there, but in 1 John 3, he says, you know, be like Christ who gave his life. Which is a good thing to say, right? But the next thing is so obvious at first it stumbled me. Don't be like Cain. Isn't that obvious? He says, don't be like Cain who slew his brother. But the word that he used for slew is a ritual word. In other words, when Abel slew a lamb and offered it to God, that was a God-prescribed ritual. Cain didn't just murder his brother. He slew him. He, that's a ritual too. He didn't offer his brother to God, but he did offer up his brother to his wounded pride, his hatred, his hurt feelings, and his feelings of rejection. You see what I'm saying? It's ritual. You know when those Egyptians were getting their head cut off? There's a lot of hate in those people that did that. But that even goes beyond hate. That's a ritual. That is worship. Misguided worship. But worship. And one of the lessons of the story of Cain and Abel that God wanted us to see about the whole downward course of human history is this. People that won't allow someone to die from God in their place are going to make someone else pay. The obvious one is the Muslims. I sat on a plane next to a Muslim one time and was witnessing to him. And he said, we Muslims need no sacrifice. I said, then why are you killing people all over the world? How many know the other people at seats were getting nervous about that? <laughs> <laughs> I've got to remember to keep it down. <laughs> It'll have trouble at the barbershop, too. All right. <laughs> I wanted to make a point. You're right. You will not have Jesus Christ shed his blood for you. No way. It's too degrading. It's too humiliating. And we don't need it. Okay, then someone else is going to pay. America turned away from Jesus a long time ago. And, then, and, and since then, how many babies have been killed? That's ritual too. That's Moloch. That's why judgment's coming and can't be diverted. We worshipped Moloch and we've slain people on the altar of our own self. Self-fulfillment. Feminism, you got to be the president of the bank, not a mother. And so we have slain. That's one of the lessons here. And it's the whole direction of the human race. All false religion ends up being violent, even Buddhism. Everyone's uh, claiming to be Zen or Buddhist or something like that, and they're trying to act like they're peace-loving and everything like that. Well, Buddhists are forcing Christians to convert in, in Burma right now at the point of a gun. <laughs> and if you think the Muslims go nuts, wait till the Hindus go off. It's frightening. Hindus go crazy. Burned an Australian missionary, his wife and his children in a car, alive, recently. Forced conversions in India. No, all false religion, including secular humanism, is violent and bloody. And one of the core reasons why is found right here in this story. It's the only way to have peace, and the only way to have peace with God, and the only way to even be at peace among ourselves, is to humble ourselves and to accept the God-appointed bloody sacrifice. But even Christianity in many places is going apostate, moving away from the whole idea of stuff like propitiation. What is propitiation? That's a sacrifice to appease wrath. 
Well, the Bible says Jesus is a propitiation for our sins. Not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Amen? And that presupposes wrath. Well, there's Christians who are getting embarrassed by that. What happens when Christianity turns away from the substitution, the death of Christ as the center? Oh, what good is it? Like Jesus said, what good is Saul if it loses his favor? Well, it's a pretty good social thing. Social gospel. Reforming society by trying to change laws. Fake humaneness. The tender mercies of the wicked. Nothing else. It's all in the bloody sacrifice. I was amazed when I first became a Christian because, Are you washed in the blood? What can take away my sin? I'm thinking, yeah, what? Well, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And it's like the blood is everywhere. Now one of the ways you know that things are going apostate is when that all stops. When it's not about wrath or propitiation or substitution or sacrifice or blood. Okay. See, Cain had a theology and Abel had a creed. What's the theology of the first murder? Will worship. You know what will worship is? Where you're going to do it your way. You don't care what God says about it. You're going to come up with your own way. That's called will worship. Self-redemption. Salvation by works. Acknowledging the creator alone. Trying to mitigate the curse without repentance. The only way to be free of the curse is to repent. Is to come under Christ cling to Christ Amen. and this always ends up persecuting Cain always persecutes Abel that's why though Islam never came until 600 AD the Bible didn't predict it by name because God's not all that interested in the names of pagan gods but the Bible anticipated it and this is one of the chapters that strongly anticipates Islam Cain always persecutes Abel. They slew, they slew the Egyptians as a sacrificial rite, an offering to a pagan god. And what's Abel's creed? See, the Bible says in the book of Jude at the end, Woe to them! They've gone the way of Cain! What is the way of Cain, man? It's not murder at first. It's moving away from the cross and the blood and the sacrifice into smarmy good worksism, do goodism. The United Way. That's the way it came. Woe to them. They've gone the way of Cain. He says that Abel had a creed, and that is the humble acceptance of God's way. And it's based on substitution. That's the verse. Someone prayed the verse out that actually God used to save me. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Wow. That we might be made the righteousness of God. Can we ever get over the wonder of it? Can we ever, ever grow past that? Can we ever think that now we've graduated onto deeper things? Could there be anything deeper? Like John Wesley wrote, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Wow. And yet to reject that? That's the way of Cain. And Abel's creed is that the Creator is to be worshipped, but also the Redeemer. And he patiently was waiting for relief. And even endured persecution, upholding the truth. And where's the end of it? Christ. Christ. And where's the end of the way of Cain? The Antichrist. And where's the end of the way of Abel? Heaven. A city not made by man. A city whose builder and maker is God himself. Amen. Where's the end of the way of Cain? Another city. 
That's another thing about this chapter is unique. It just tells how the first city was built. Well, it's not just an idle curiosity. There's a theology underneath this. The city. God brings them up on trial. He summons Cain before the bar of justice. And Cain, now he, now he begins talking to God. Look at verse... Uh, nine. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? That's oh, sarcasm. You know you're on your way to hell when you're sarcastic about God. When people are sarcastic about God, you can know that they're on their way to hell. Am I my brother's keeper? And this is funny because I've heard so many politicians say, I'm trying to live out my favorite Bible verse. I'm my brother's keeper. Not realizing that it was uttered by a murderer in sarcastic defiance of God. I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother, brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. Isn't that interesting, the whole idea of blood crying from the, the ground? Even in modern crime investigations, you know, they can't get rid of the blood. The blood does cry out. And now you're cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When you till the ground, it shall not from here on yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall you be in the earth. A restless wanderer. A restless wanderer. That's when Cain talks. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Now he's talking to God. Behold, you driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I'll be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it'll come, past, it'll come to pass that everyone that finds me will slay me. Yes, that's what murder does. It begets more murder. All of a sudden, the earth is a much less secure place. I can remember when we didn't lock our doors in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. When I mean, you can leave your keys in your car. You hold the wages of sin. You pay in a thousand different ways. A million different ways. That horrible spirit of murder. I remember when a murder in the newspaper was a huge thing. See in Rapids, Iowa? May as well be Mayberry. Okay. But man, when it gets to be no big deal. He said, uh, the Lord, even here, shows mercy. The Lord said unto him, Whoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Okay, now think about this. Cain is a murderer, a convicted murderer. And yet he complains to the Lord, and God's mercy, the Lord gives him something. He puts some kind of a mark on him. We don't know what it is. But then he says, if anyone kills you, then I will take sevenfold vengeance on them. Okay, now what's that teach you? How could you do more than kill someone back? If someone killed someone, all the state can do is kill them. So I wouldn't call that sevenfold vengeance. What's God saying there? He's saying, I'm telling you, if anyone kills you, I assure you, they will suffer forever in hell. That was the mark. Because that's the only way that you could go more than death. Remember what Jesus said, don't fear him who has power to hurt the body. Fear the one that has power to cast body and soul into hell. Did you see those Egyptians singing praises to Jesus? Is there led to the slaughter? You know what that does to the Muslims that are killing them? Paul said in Philippians, if you keep your cool when you're being persecuted, you're t a token to those people that they're on the wrong side of God and they're on their way to hell. I predict many, many Muslim terrorists will become Christians. They'll be like the Apostle Paul. The churches won't even know what to do with them. Should we let them in or not? I don't know. <laughs> Guy makes me nervous. <laughs> I got an idea. Let them in, but hide the cutlery. All right. <laughs> And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. 
But he dwelled in the land of Nam on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. And she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Wait a minute. You're supposed to wander all over. But he built a city. What's he doing? Oh, he's defying the divine sentence. So he built a city. The first city was built in defiance of the command of God. But guess what? Cities are restless. Cities are full of wandering and restlessness. And people estranged from God, even if they settle down somewhere, can't really have peace because the sentence of God trumps anything you try to do. The first city was built as a defiance against the sentence of God. I don't have to wander, nor do I have to depend on the ground. We can set up markets. We can settle in here. I can be protected by strong walls and towers. We can organize. We can get together. We don't need God, nor do we need to obey God, nor do I need to submit to God. In fact, he named the city for his son, Enoch, but Enoch means a fresh start. The meaning of this story is that the first murderer, uh, after God sentenced him to wandering, instead of repenting and humbling himself and turning to God, it says he went away from the presence of God and he made a fresh start without God. What's happening in America? What's happening all over the world? Atheism is taking the upper hand and trying to reinvent the formerly Christian world and trying to make a fresh start and to build not a city but a utopia without God. Without God. Now this is in the first book of the Bible. This is not about idle curiosity. What, how did the first city come about? Oh, I don't know. Let's see. No. This is spiritual and theological. And the way the Bible structures it for the rest of the Bible is that there are two cities of concern. You see where it says Cain built a city? Cain built a city. Named it after his son. And you think, there you go, defiant and rebellious man, moving away from God, organizing himself, and building a city, though he's sentenced to wander. But God already knew where man was going. And God trumped him. Because if you were to go back to Genesis 2, which I won't take it, but where it says, God took out of Adam's side and he built in him. It's the same word. A wife. Okay. Same word. A wife. So, yes, Eve is a woman. And that was Adam's wife. But it's the same word that Cain built a city. And basically, when you get to the book of Revelation, you see that out of heaven comes a city. A bridal city. The bride. Okay. There's two cities. There's two cities. The city of man and the city of God. The one is based on the love of self. And the other is based on the love of God. Now everybody in the world, whether they know it or not, is a citizen of one of those two cities. It'll become Babylon or Jerusalem, okay, different names. But the whole theology of the Bible separates men into two cities. Now the one city that's the city of man is allowed to come to its climax. And that's what we're seeing today. Technology, uh, organization, human ingenuity, talent, entertainment. I mean, you look at these machines. I remember being stunned by the fax machine. 
We sent a letter to Bob and Cindy North in India, and I thought, are you kidding me? It's there now? <laughs> I, told, I can't even begin to describe these. I don't even know the names of them anymore. These little handheld things, complete computers, more information in your hand than the New York City Public Library, access to anything, anytime, anywhere. Oh, the city of man! You do so much. So clever. It's so estranged from God. Every single part of it, every institution of it is revealed as Antichrist. Not just the bad ones, even the good ones. Law, medicine, education, all have been become Antichrist. The city of man is going to come to its apex and then be judged by God. The city of God is being prepared in heaven and will come down. Okay? This is part of the meaning of this, okay? He, it uh, goes on to talk about the, the, uh, the verse 19, the, the children, the children of, or verse 16, uh, Cain, or 17, Cain knew his wife, she could see, bear Enoch, he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Fresh start. And unto Enoch was born Ered, and Ered begat Mehujael, and Mehujael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. Lamech, the seventh from Adam. Lamech took unto him two wives. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Two wives. <laughs> Just a few chapters earlier, the marriage is defined. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. But by the time you get to the seventh generation, then everything comes to its maturity. Here's a man so defiant, a real son of Cain. So defiant, he takes on two wives. Here's the first recorded song in the Bible. And it's not a song of praise. Ada bore uh, Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handled the harp and the organ. And Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. Notice the emphasis on technology. The arts, agriculture, because that's what the city of man is all about, and that is the ingenuity and the dominion of man, even in a fallen state. But the whole emphasis is to mitigate the curse without repentance. Right at the beginning. And then it says, the first recorded song, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a young man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Look what he's comparing himself to God. All God can do is send someone to hell. I'll make their life a living hell. He sings of violence. The rap music and everything we see today. That's a sign that we're right at the end. Such is the way of Cain. The new start without God. The path of the wicked. But Adam knew his wife again and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, she said, has appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. And then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Two ways, two paths, two prototypes, mm -hmm. two ends. Antichrist, Christ, heaven, hell. Humble submission and worship of God, self-exaltation and humanism. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, help us. Help us, O oh Lord. We live in the last days. I'm also very, very concerned about our children, Lord. For the culture of Cain is so strong. And the technology is so beautiful and fascinating. And the godlessness is so prevalent and prevailing. It almost looks like that's a prevailing wisdom. What will our children do, God? Snatch them out of the fire. Let them be walking in the way of the seed of the woman. Let them worship Jesus. Let them see through the vanity, the pomp, the violence, the hatred, the, the, the immorality, O oh Lord, the power of secularism, the power of atheism that's being brandished now. Let them see this just but for a little time, that your judgment is sure, that you're coming again to judge the world in righteousness, that there really is a heaven and a hell, a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless.